Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the 2022 edition of the annual Kesterton Lecture. My name is Alan Thompson. I'm the head of the journalism program here at Carleton. This is the 22nd annual version of this event named in honor of Wilfred Kesterton. I suppose 22nd annual is a bit of a misnomer since the event wasn't held last year because of the pandemic. It is wonderful to be back in person for this evening's event with the remarkable Omaira Issa. I'll provide you with some more information about the evening in just a moment, but first I would like to invite Dr. Brenda O'Neill, the Dean of the Faculty of Public Affairs, to say a few words of welcome. Thank you, Alan, and uh, good evening, everyone. As I'll echo uh, Alan's words in saying, it is nice to be back, back face to face and on campus seeing everybody here. Uh, the first thing that I would like to do is welcome you. It's very much my pleasure, as Alan said, to welcome you to the 22nd uh, annual Kesterton Lecture. And I'm just going to stick with it being the annual Kesterton Lecture. Um, the first thing we want to do, though, uh, is to acknowledge that the land on which we are this evening, and Carleton is, is the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. And I always say I want, it's important that we say that and take a moment to think about it because it's important to not just say it as it becomes rote, right? It's important that we think about it and give it the, its due. The Kesterton Lecture was established in honor of one of Carleton's first students and then professor, Wilfred Kesterton. He was a journalist and a Second World War veteran who was a leading figure at the School of Journalism for 40 years. I believe that he would be extremely pleased to see Omaira Issa here this evening, a fellow Saskatchewanian, uh, take the podium and speak with us this evening. I think it's important as Dean to let you know that the School of Journalism and Communication is one of Carleton's original academic departments, and it is also one of the 12 units in the Faculty of Public Affairs, and a very important one. Part of the faculty's mission, and one that I can honestly say brought me here as Dean, was to foster informed citizenship. And of course, our journalism program has made a significant contribution to that, to informing citizenship of all types in Canada since it began after World War II. We're fortunate this evening to have this speaker, Omaira Issa, to share her experiences and wisdom with us this evening, uh, as well as our moderator, Professor uh, Nanaba Duncan. And I'm going to go off script for a minute. I just want to say, as a scholar, what I what I studied was uh, gender and politics, and thinking about the differences between women and men in political participation and political leadership. And just as I decided to come uh, to become dean, one of the newer topics that became uh, an important one and began to do new research on was the violence against women in politics, which we all know is is a problem. Violence in politics in particular, in general, is a problem. But when we think about gender, we know that there's a particular kind of violence that is directed to women in politics. And so it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts as well, uh, Omaira, this, this evening. Uh, I'm interested in being here. I really am happy to be here. So please, everyone, uh, along with me, enjoy this thoughtful and engaging discussion. And thanks to Alan uh, for organizing it. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you, Dean O'Neill. Uh, and thanks for all your support for journalism and for being with us. Uh, it matters a lot. Uh, we've been holding this annual lecture in honor of Wilfred Kesterton since the year 2000. Could I just ask for a show of hands, uh, how many people in the room this evening knew Wilf? Okay, I don't feel quite so old. Uh, uh, when I was a journalism student here in the early 1980s, Wilf was still a force to be reckoned with, uh, even as an emeritus professor. 
and I had the honour of having him serve on the exam board for my honours research project. In attending this event over the years, and this is the journalism program's major keynote, it has sometimes occurred to me that we make reference to Wilfred Kesterton and assume people know something about the person that we're celebrating. So, just a reminder. Uh, Wilfred Kesterton was born in Regina in 1914. He was a school teacher when he enlisted in the armed forces, served in England and Holland. As a Second World War veteran, he enrolled in Carleton's fledgling journalism school and became one of the first graduates of the new Bachelor of Journalism program in 1949. He was hired immediately <laughs> as a journalism lecturer upon graduation as the school's second full-time faculty member. In the next four decades, he would help shape this institution. Until his retirement in 1979, he taught virtually every student who went through this program. And he got to know them. I was telling Omira, like nowadays we get an online, students maybe don't know this, we get an online photo class list that helps us to get to know our students. Wilf took Polaroid pictures of his students and created his own sort of system of getting to know who the people were that he was teaching. And then kept that going uh, in terms of where they were, where they were working, and so that he could do reference letters for people after the fact. He specialized in uh, media law and journalism history. And through his writing and research, he really helped to define Canadian journalism as one of the first to bring serious scholarly attention to the news media in this country. He literally wrote the book on journalism in Canada with the 1967 publication, The History of Journalism in Canada. Professor Kesterton was well known for a lot of things. He was famous here at Carleton as well for his media law lecture on obscenity. Imagine, if you will, a smartly dressed, neatly combed, exceedingly polite and genteel fellow standing at a lectern. Suddenly, he bursts forth with a stream of the filthiest swear words you can imagine, and I won't repeat them. He did this to shock and to make a memorable point about the liberties and limits of free speech. The media landscape in this country that he helped to define for his generation has been transformed since Wilf's time. I'm not sure how Wilf would characterize the current phase of journalism history we are living through. I'm not sure what he would make of the vile obscenities and threats that pollute the inbox and social media stream of our guest of honour this evening. But I am very confident of one thing. I think Wilf, a prairie boy at heart, would be thrilled to hear that a long-time prairie girl and I did ask Omira if it was okay. <laughs> a long time prairie girl like Omira Issa was about to deliver a lecture in his honor about a groundbreaking journalism project that focused on Canada's prairie provinces. This evening's event will be moderated by my colleague, Professor Nanaba Duncan, the inaugural CARDI Chair in Journalism, Diversity and Inclusion Studies. Nanaba is an associate professor here at Carleton where she's focused on launching the Marianne Shad Carey Centre for Journalism and Belonging, a research centre which advocates, supports and participates in inclusive and belonging focused journalism in Canada. Nanaba is also co-founder of Media Girlfriends, a podcast production company that supports more perspectives in news media. Before joining Carleton, Nanaba was a host and producer at CBC Radio for 15 years. Her most recent position was as the host of the weekend morning show, Fresh Air. Tonight, she is the host for the Kesterton Lecture. And in just a moment, I'll invite Nanaba to come to the podium and properly introduce our guest speaker. Omira will then deliver opening remarks from the podium before she and Nanaba engage in a discussion here on stage. After that discussion, audience members, both in person and virtual will get a chance to pose questions. At the end of the evening, you're invited to join us for a reception in the atrium. Washrooms are across the atrium, 
down the back hall on the opposite, opposite side of the building. Please uh, be prepared to show your ticket to one of our volunteers when you come back into the room. And with that, I would like to invite Professor Nanaba Duncan to introduce this year's Kesterton Lecture. Nanaba. Good evening, everybody. How are you? Good. What a privilege it is in our times to be alive and together for something like this. If you agree, say, I agree. I agree. Excellent. So I'm going to give you um, a primer on our guest, Omaira Issa. She's an award-winning senior reporter for CBC News based in Saskatchewan. Omaira was born in Morocco, raised in Niger, and she's lived in Saskatchewan for over 20 years. She's fluent in five languages. What are they? What are they? English, French, Spanish. Which ones? Sarma and Hausa. Five languages. She's got a degree in economics from the University of Alberta. And today she's a 2022 2023 CBC Radio Canada Fellow. She's a part of the William Southern Journalism Fellowships at Massey College. Um, Omaira's career started at Radio Canada in 2014 uh, in Saskatoon. She was reporting on major Saskatchewan stories for a national audience from the Humboldt Broncos bus crash tragedy to the shooting of Colton Bushy and the Gerald Stanley trial. She covers breaking news. She investigates a wide range of topics. She produces original content on digital TV, radio platforms. Omaira has co-created and co-produced CBC's Black on the Prairies. This is a groundbreaking interactive project that project. brought life to stories about Black lives in the present, past, and future in Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Alberta. She's won, this project has won lots of accolades, including a national RTDNA, big deal in the journalism industry, <laughs> and a digital publishing award, another big deal in our industry. But most importantly, Omira's got a passion for telling stories authentically and with care. And I know that because she told me in our WhatsApp chat today. And I share that with you because Omira is also a friend, she's a colleague, and she's an inspiration. You are. For the 2022 Kesterton Lecture, please welcome Omaira Issa. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, I said. Good evening. <laughs> Thank you. You know, I'm an African woman, so we call and respond. Thank you so very much, um, Alan Thompson, for the invitation. Thank you, Dean O'Neill. Thank you, Nana Ba, for this humbling introduction. It is an honor for me to be here tonight with you. Uh, last time I was in Ottawa was four years ago as a reporter with Radio Canada at the Ottawa Bureau. So it's truly a pleasure to be back in the capital city. I'd like to begin with the recognition of the violent histories of where we are and an acknowledgement of the ongoing conflicts of these lands. This is unceded Anishinaabe Algonquin territory and remains the homes of Indigenous people. As a Black woman who arrived in this country 20 years ago, I recognize my responsibilities in relation to the waters, to the lands, and to the air. I would like to recognize the incredible contributions to and the pivotal role of Wilf Kesterton in shaping Canadian journalism. We happen to be from the same province of Saskatchewan, uh, as Alan said, so it is my honor to be here. And I hope, um, you know, Alan said, he, you know, we wouldn't know what he, what he would say, but I hope he would be proud to have a Prairie Girl stand here tonight with you. I would also like to acknowledge my wonderful colleagues in the Black on the Praise project, including Ifi Chiutelu and Melissa Fundira. 
I mentioned a bit earlier that I'm an African woman. I'm a Songhoi Fulani woman from Niger. And it is important for us to call people in, to name them, to celebrate them, and to thank them. In the spirit of those African traditions, I would also like to call in my grandmother. At the age of 10, she taught me the importance of paying attention to the world I live in and to the environment where I live. And so every day, we would listen to the radio. We would listen to the news. This has inspired me to become a journalist and continues to animate me decades later. My question tonight is how do we witness our world? I want to explore this question tonight by taking you on a voyage across the Canadian prairies. It's a place I've been calling home for more than 20 years. It is a voyage across the black prairies, particularly past, present and future a voyage that will lead us to the most urgent current moment in Canadian journalism. Let me start then by extending an invitation to you, an invitation to think of our country from a different perspective, an invitation to imagine Canada differently. This invitation is anchored in the ways we see, we understand and approach our world. I would like to transport us to a different place. And it begins, if you know me a little bit, with a sunset. Here's a photograph of a prairie sunset I recently took in Saskatchewan, where, of course, when we think of the Canadian prairies, we think of these endless skies, these beautiful sunsets. Uh, we think of the beautiful, heartbreaking, uh, bre breathtaking, stunning skies. We see the distinct prairie landscape with its openness, but also, let's say, it, its flatness. For many, these prairies are not immediately associated with blackness. When we think of the prairies as a geographical and sociological space, we don't necessarily think of black people who have been living there for a very long time. Personally, I came of age in Saskatchewan and lived on the prairies for 20, more than 20 years. The black experience in the prairies actually spans more than 200 years. From black indigenous um, language translators in the 19th century to laborers in, in the same 19th century, to homesteaders and railway porters in the 20th century, to teachers and artists, community builders in the 21st century. Black people have been an integral part of prairie life, have contributed to building the region, and have absolutely weaved long-standing relations with all different kinds of communities, particularly indigenous communities. Here's a photo of a group of black settlers in front of a church they built in the region of Maidstone in Saskatchewan. This photo was taken around 1912. I came across this picture when I was researching Black Prairie history in 2017 and met the descendants of this incredible woman, Maddie Mays. Let me tell you a little bit about Maddie Mays. Maddie Mays is the matriarch of the community that I just showed you, known as the Shiloh people. Maddie Mays, I believe, is actually a central figure of Black Prairie life, of Prairie Canadian history, but also of Canadian history. She was a formerly enslaved Black woman who arrived from Oklahoma 112 years ago in Saskatchewan. She left Jim Crow United States for the promise of cheap land and freedom. Her and her husband, Joseph, led dozens and dozens of people from the United States to Saskatchewan in 1910. In fact, there was a time in the prairies when you could actually travel across the land and see all black communities. There were particularly uh, four communities in Alberta and a community in Saskatchewan. And I'll just cite their names because I think it's important to call in people in spaces. So the communities were Amber Valley, Willwood, Camsey, Breton, and Maidstone. So five black communities were settled in Alberta and in Saskatchewan at the turn of the 20th century. And in Manitoba, there were also communities that were urban, but also rural. And black people also lived in cities, including Edmonton, Calgary, Winnipeg, since the beginning of those cities. Here are some incredible photographs from the Ernest Brown collection at the Provincial Archives of Alberta. I absolutely love these pictures. These pictures were taken uh, at the turn of 20th century in Edmonton. And I can only imagine that uh, these incredible uh, people were very proud to wear their beautiful clothes and to sit 
for uh, in front of Ernest Brown, who uh, is a very famous Canadian um, photographer based out of Alberta. He, he, he worked out of there for, for a very long time. And I absolutely love them, so I wanted to share them with you. Now I would like to introduce you to Ron Mapp. Here's Ron Mapp. I met Ron Mapp in 2020. His family has been in Alberta for more than 110 years, six generations. I met him first in his home in Edmonton on an early November morning. And then we drove a few hours north to the town where he grew up, Amber Valley. And by the time we got on the road, the sun was rising. And if you've seen a prairie sunrise, it's pretty stunning. The colors were incredible. Purple undertones, beautiful pinks. And I went there with Ron Mapp to walk on the land because I thought it was important in the reporting to actually be settled there and to have a feel for the place. It felt like a pilgrimage for Ron. And for me as a journalist, it was more than an assignment. It was a discovery. It was meaningful for me to see the remnants of a black community on the prairies. At its height, Umber Valley was the biggest black town on the prairies. More than a thousand people lived there. They had a church, they had a cemetery, they had businesses, they had a school, they had a whole community. Ron Mapp's great-grandfather, Henry Sneed, led in fact hundreds of African-Americans from the American South to Umber Valley in Alberta in 1911. Ron Mapp's family is very important. His story is very important because it speaks to a larger Canadian story and history. So let me take a moment for a little bit of another historical moment um, to inject a little bit of history. In August 1911, five months after Ron Mapp's uh, great-grandfather's uh, party arrived in Alberta, Canadian Prime Minister Wilfrid Laurier actually signed an order in council that prohibited for one year the landing of any immigrant belonging, and I'm citing here, I'm quoting the order, the landing in Canada of any immigrant belonging to the Negro race, which is deemed unsuitable to the climate and requirements of Canada. Black migration to Canada dwindled for decades after that order in council. I will get back to that history. But let me just pause for a moment to introduce you to a remarkable young man. Here is Braden Page. I took this photo in June 4th, 2020. And we all remember what summer 2020 was like. It was the height of the Black Lives Matter movement globally across Canada, the United States, and the world. And of course, the praise were not exempt. Braden Page organized the largest protest in the history of the city of Saskatoon. 4,000 people showed up and walked in the streets of the city. People from different backgrounds, creeds, cultures, communities, marched and chanted slogans like no justice, no peace. And as you can see here, I snapped that picture at exactly the moment when he took a knee in front of the Saskatoon police headquarters and 4,000 people followed suit right behind me, behind him. And, uh, and absolutely, as you can see, put their fists in the air. And they remained there silent for eight minutes and 46 seconds. That was the amount of time Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin had his knee on George Floyd's neck. Now, I'll tell you something. I have covered protests across Saskatchewan for years and years and years by that time, but I had never seen anything like that before. What I saw was absolutely remarkable. For the first time, I saw young black people lead people in the streets, in Prairie Streets, in Saskatoon. It was unique, it was truly remarkable. Braden Page himself is an interesting character because he was 21 at the time, he was studying at the University of Saskatchewan. He had never organized a protest before, but he was at home watching the video of George Floyd's death and he thought that actually reminded him of his father. And so he wanted to do something. He said he didn't want to be silent anymore. So he organized a protest to bring awareness to what was happening in Saskatchewan. So while I was reporting on the Black Lives Matter movement in Saskatchewan, I was also keeping an eye on what was happening in neighboring Alberta and Manitoba. And what I saw was absolutely remarkable. 25,000 people walked in the streets of Winnipeg, 
There were protests in small towns like Innisfield in Alberta. There was a fibrility in the air. You could just feel it. It was different. It felt absolutely different. It was a turning point. It was unprecedented. Black people on the prairies made, made headlines in new ways. But most importantly, I was hearing from audience members a need to understand the moment beyond the headlines. I knew that as journalists, we had a responsibility not only to capture the moment, but to explain its significance, its importance and resonance regionally, and its meaning. We had to help the public make sense of the moment. That's why we created Black on the Prairies. To help audiences grasp the complexity of Black life, past, present, and future, and to put the moment in context and provide real analysis. We knew that to make sense of the Black Lives Matter movement and its iteration on the prairies, we had to do something very important. We had to put the relationship, a clear relationship between Maddie Mays, Braden Page, Henry Sneed, Ron Mapp, to draw a line, a direct line between the past, the present, and the future. This is the work of witnessing. This brings me to the core of what is Black on the Prairies. And I want to show you a little bit Black on the Prairies. We'll just take a quick look at the website. So this is a beautiful imagery, as we can see, of you know, uh, historical images of people arriving on the prairies, but also contemporary images. And uh, we see, of course, these beautiful little children on the prairies. And uh, if you scroll down on the page, you'll actually see that we wanted to create a museum-like experience for audiences so that they can take in information and really, really be in conversation with blackness on the prairies. And that was absolutely important for us. Black on the Prairies is a journalistic project that explores the past, the present, and future of Black Prairie life. We placed Black experiences at the center of the Prairie narrative as part of the Canadian story. Black on the Prairies is an ambitious project. It's more than 30 stories across radio, TV, digital platforms. It's a collection of journalistic pieces personal essays, audio and visual storytelling, and so much more. I just love this picture. It's such a stunning picture of this, of Tasha Spillett, who is uh, this Afro-Indigenous woman from, from Manitoba. The project emerged with the intent to make sure that the regional experiences of Black people in Alberta, in Saskatchewan and Manitoba, were included in the global and national conversation around anti-Black racism and the Black experiences. We did that by doing serious journalism, informed by history, by data, by analysis. We turned to Statistics Canada, to leading historians. We talked to more than 100 people as part of the project. We knew that we were doing something that was new, that was ambitious, and so we wanted to capture as many voices as possible. What we did was this. We simply presented a new vision of the prairies. We were countering assumptions that black people were new to the region, that they didn't contribute much to its development, or that they were minor figures, at best footnotes in history records. In fact, we shifted the narrative by presenting 200 years of black presence on the prairies. Let me just take a moment. 200 years of black life on the prairies. That simple information has now become a powerful vantage point from which to understand the region. This was a powerful moment in Canadian journalism. We affirmed that there is a complexity, a depth, and a texture to black prairie life. With black on the prairies, we wanted to represent the full breadth of not just the black experience on the prairies, but of the Canadian experience, which includes Black Prairie life. It was a corrective to how the prairie reality is presented, an intervention, if you will. We defied stereotypes. 
we showed that you can report on black communities by har without harming them and by truly representing their full humanity. I would venture out and say that Black on the Prairies is an exploration of Canada as a country. This is important because stories help shape our world. They are not neutral. They leave a mark. Through Black on the Prairies, we presented a new story about the prairies and the country. And this was bold. This was, this was unprecedented. This was bold. We wanted to take a moment to talk about history because journalism can be anchored in history. I actually want to take a moment to talk about that. I fundamentally believe that history and the present are intimately related. And they are in conversation with each other and they echo each other's demands. With Black on the Prairies, we faced history from the periphery. It was a corrective to the practice of journalism that is centered around the present. So of course, when you're journalists, you're like covering the present, right? You're recording what's happening. You're following breaking news all the time. And history can be easily disregarded. But when we disengage with history, we ignore who we are as a country. Yet journalism function is to reveal the truths of the country, to show us who we are, including the, different, the difficult parts related to racism and exclusion. This helps move the needle forward towards a more inclusive country. So by centering history in our storytelling in Black on the Prairies, we gave context, which is deeply important when you're, when you're reporting on race in our country. And most importantly, we showed that when journalism engages with history, it unearths new narratives, new stories. This is a powerful way to present facts and ultimately hold power to account. This brings me to a crucial point about method. How did we go about it? So for Black on the Prairies, we assembled a community advisory board of 10 people to help us with the storytelling. The advisors, of course, didn't have editorial decision power because that's as journalists, that is our prerogative, but they shared their curiosities, their knowledge, and they challenged us. And this advisory board allowed us as storytellers and journalists to be rooted in community and to capture stories we wouldn't traditionally hear, but to be also honest in our storytelling and to be accountable, to truly bear witness. This is unique and rarely done in our profession. And I'm proud to say that Black on the Prairies has innovated on how we tell stories in our country. Journalism can successfully be rooted in community and be accountable to tell stories authentically. This is crucial because the purpose of our work, I believe, is to serve. For this, though, we need to be able to innovate as journalists. We need to find new ways to relate to audiences in a direct and non-extractive way. This is particularly important when we're reporting on marginalized, underrepresented, and wrongly represented communities. We also intentionally centered Black women's stories in the project because we know, when we know that women are often absented from and wrongly represented in historical narratives. We engaged, we elevated, and deliberately centered Black and Indigenous storytellers in the project. In fact, 90% of the content creators, the journalists, the photographers, the throughout the whole operation were Black and Indigenous, 90%. This was unprecedented, particularly in that part of the country. It didn't just happen. We were intentional about it. You have to be intentional about these things. Today, I'll say Black, Indigenous, and journalists of color are uniquely positioned through their lived experiences, their connections to their communities, and their nuanced understanding of our country to provide relevant analysis practice journalism at the highest standards and propose new ideas on how Canadian journalism can reach its highest promise. And I believe the highest promise of Canadian journalism is to inform, to hold power to account, and to correct the public records when needed. This is important because journalism reflects our country and must contend with its implication as well in some of our violent histories. 
I want to take a moment and talk about impact. Um, the impact of Black on the Prairies was instantaneous. We heard from Canadians coast to coast to coast who felt that they were learning new things about our country that they weren't aware of before. And we were hearing from people saying, we didn't know. We didn't know that there's been Black people for that long on the prairies. We didn't know that um, the fastest growing Black population in Canada is actually in Alberta and Manitoba and in Saskatchewan. And then we were also hearing from Black people in that region saying, we felt heard, we, fer we felt seen, we felt represented. And I'll just share a bit of a little story I remember when we published this, the project, I heard from a young black woman who, in Saskatchewan and she said, you know, Omaira, I'm so grateful for this and I'm in tears because I wonder what this would have meant for me to have had access to this information when I was growing up in Regina. And that meant so much. But Black on Prairies also transcended traditional audiences. We were able to attract young and diverse audiences. The project now has left just the digital space and is now in schools. We have created a teacher's guide for students K-12 to in French and in English that are available across the country. And I'll show you this incredible photograph. We're going to go back. Oops. There we go. This is a class of 26 grade seven students in Regina with their teacher, Christian Mbanza. Uh, they now learn about Black Prairie history and Canadian history through Black on the Prairies. I met them earlier this year and they were absolutely remarkable. They wrote little notes for me. <laughs> uh, they wrote little notes and they said, um, one of them said, it opened my world. And one of them said, you know, I just feel so seen and I talk about this with my parents at supper. And I just thought, ah, that's incredible. And the content is also taught in universities right now across the country. We also developed a partnership, partnership, several partnerships with museums, with libraries. We wanted to be where the public is, not just tell them, hey, come find us on our digital pl platforms and radio and TV platforms. We wanted to be closer to people. And I believe the project will play a role in the collective understanding of the prairies for years to come. This, unfortunately, did not come without objection from a faction of Canadians. We anticipated this. We knew this was going to happen. And we moderated our posts on social media and closed comments we knew that some people were going to take issue with a project that centered blackness in the Canadian conversation. We also knew that some people were allergic to the truth. Unfortunately, I have personally received a lot of hate mail. I have to say that in the last two years, since the publication of Black on the Prairies and since becoming a national reporter at CBC, I have repeatedly received hate-filled messages. These messages have included death threats, anti-black and misogynist slurs. The threats are directly related to my work as a journalist. It is understood that these threats are part of a, a broader pattern of coordinated attacks who are in, led by a certain faction of the Canadian population who are intent on harassing black, racial, ra racialized, and women journalists, as well as some politicians. We cannot underestimate the threat this pauses to democracies through tactics of disinformation and online harassment. These kind of attacks have historically threatened democracies and they continue to today by targeting, among others, journalists whose work is essential. For some Canadian journalists, the fundamental role of informing and holding power to account is accompanied with risks, high risks to their personal safety. I'm among those journalists. 
I know I'm specifically targeted because of my identity as a black Muslim woman and my commitment to help guide national conversations around inclusion and diversity in newsrooms and shifting our understanding of our country. Myself and some journalists, particularly queer, trans, racialized female journalists, women journalists, are increasingly working in what I would qualify a hostile environment in Canada. Journalists are under attack in our country. These threats are meant to silence them, to effectively drive them out of the industry and out of the larger conversation. In so far as these acts seek to silence, I believe we need to understand them as a form of political violence. This situation has gotten politicians, including the Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, to react, saying the pattern of harassment of journalists is incredibly alarming and completely unacceptable. He called on police forces across the country to take the threat seriously. To which I will say, we also need to keep in mind that not all journalists feel safe reporting harm to police. Historically and in present day, black, indigenous, and communities of color disproportionately experience a difficult relationship with law enforcement forces. Recently, a coalition of news organizations and press freedom groups called on Canadian police and police policymakers to address the increased rise, rise in online hate and harassment by penning a letter to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. I believe these attacks will continue to escalate and that it is imperative that we act as an industry and as a country to ensure the safety of journalists who are being or will be threatened. I say all this knowing there could be more threats against my life. Let me just take a moment. I must say, when I embarked on my career as a journalist about a decade ago, I didn't anticipate that my work will lead to threats against my safety in our country. Being a witness has come at a cost. But I refuse to back down. Canadian journalism is fundamental to our democracy, and I am certain the function of my work is to push for improvements, to challenge existing narratives, and to present fresh ways to look at our history as well as our country. Truth, open discourse, unfettered storytelling are now urgent more than ever in Canada and globally. Our role is to defend the freedom of expression by relentlessly telling the truth. This brings me to a crucial question. How will we, as a collective, fight for the truth? Everyone here has a stake in what is happening to Canadian journalism. Everyone here has a stake in what is happening to Canadian journalists who are being attacked. Fortunately, what is clear for me is that in the hardest of times, there is hope and opportunity. The opportunity here is to stand for what we believe in. Silence is simply not an option. Solidarity with the journalists who are being harassed is needed more than ever. Solutions to the increasing polarization, pollution of the information ecosystem, and toxic attacks against certain journalists in Canada will have to consider the needs of Black, Indigenous, journalists of color, women, and gender diverse storytellers. News organizations have a responsibility to effectively protect their journalists, particularly Black, Indigenous, and journalists of color who are facing risks and consequences that other journalists are not facing by simply doing their work. They are facing specific race and gender-based violence because of who they are. And that runs against our values of tolerance, diversity, and inclusion. 
What is happening to some journalists impacts the whole landscape. News organizations will need to develop industry standards and practices on how to protect their journalists and counter online hate. There needs to be legislation. Impunity online needs to impunity in real life. I'm not the only one saying that. There's been news organizations saying that. So I don't feel like I'm going out on a limb here saying, you know, a controversial statement. But at this point, I want to talk about collective care. How do we show up for each other in this moment and at all moments? Young journalists going into the profession need safe working environments free from online hate, digital harassment, racial slurs, and sexist vitriol. They ought to receive the supports they need to enter, to remain, and to thrive in the industry. It is our responsibility as an industry to ensure that. Let me take a moment. To the journalists going into the profession who are in the room tonight, I am here to tell you that your voices are needed more than ever to help us see our country for who we are. The current situation should not deter you. I'm convinced we can do this with a sustained effort to raise the public's awareness to the urgency of the moment by becoming increasingly fearless in our search for the truth, by extending solidarity to each other, and by continuously holding firm to our responsibility to not only inform the public, but challenge its assumptions. This is how we bear witness. And in bearing witness, we carry the sacred work of telling stories and fostering a reimagination of our country. Our profession and our country will be better for it. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Here we are. I know. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. Yeah. How are you? I'm good. Um, okay. You did it. I did. Uh, we're proud of you. Thank you. How do you feel about having created something that you call bold and ambitious? I feel privileged to have had the opportunity to tell the stories of black people in Canada, mm -hmm. particularly on the Canadian prairies. And I feel lucky to have been able to be a journalist and to present a new understanding of our country. Um, why, why did you call it ambitious? Like, why, why is it bold? Well, I love that question. I think I think it's bold because it's bold to say that black people have been on the prairies for 200 years. I've been on the prairies for more than 20 years. And there's this assumption that black people are new to the region, um, but they're not. And to a certain extent, there's also an assumption that, that the um, the impact and contributions of black people on the prairies are minor, when in fact they're major, they're really important. Mm -hmm. And so as a journalist, it was a responsibility that I had personally as a journalist covering our province to tell the truth and to seek out information. It was bold because we were talking to historians. We weren't just, you know, coming up with this information. Mm -hmm. We were going into historical records, archives, talking to historians, talking to experts at Statistics Canada. We talked to 100 people, more than 100 people. Can you imagine for a journalistic project, talking to more than 100 people? It's research. Yes, and it's incredible. Um, you work on this with Ifi yes. Chouetelou, um, who is also living in the area. She was living in mm -hmm. uh, Manitoba. Um, 
when you had this idea, did you have a notion of how big the project was and what you were embarking on? Yes and no. Mm. Yes, because we knew that we were doing something that had never been done before because we wanted to explore the past, the future, and the present. Mm -hmm. So we knew that was different. But we didn't know that we were going to do it at such a large scale. We thought we were going to do three themes, maybe. We ended up being five, doing five themes for the first edition and then another second edition, and we ended up with 30 stories. And did it start as a multimedia project? It did, yes. Mm -hmm from the very beginning. It was very important to reach as many Canadians as possible in as many platforms as possible in our country. So when you had the idea and you talked to Ify about it, what was that first conversation like? <laughs> um, here's how it went. Um, uh, I had just come out of covering the BLM movement in Saskatoon, and I took some time for myself. I went to like a small town in Saskatchewan. And I was thinking, OK, we need to be able to tell these stories beyond just the headlines. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, how about a larger project? And then I texted Ify, mm -hmm. and I said, can you talk? And she said, yes, I can talk in 20 minutes. And then we talked, and we knew that we had something that was precious, that was important, and we wanted to bring it to Canadians. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that there were that on the project it was 90% black and indigenous people. Mm -hmm. What was it like working, like being a black journalist, working with another black journalist on a black subject <laughs> with black people? <laughs> what was that like? <laughs> <laughs> it was great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was fabulous, you know, and I'm laughing because it's so unique and unusual for us to be able to be in spaces where you don't have to explain basic things about your humanity. Mm. That's what it was about, you know. You didn't have to explain basic things. You could just start from like the vintage point of, okay, we're all black, mm -hmm. you know, we know that there's complexities in the black experience and multi-layered experiences. Let's talk about that. And let's bring in Canadians in that conversation. It just seems like a dream. <laughs> it was. To me. It was great, though. Because so many of us journalists, we don't really get that opportunity to do that. So it's important on so many mm -hmm. levels what you've done. Mm. Um, hmm. You know, we do contain multitudes. So when you're working with mm -hmm. a number of people, you, you, how, how big was your, actual, your team, first of all? That's, that's a great question. So we had a core team mm -hmm. of a few people. And then we had uh, people across the country as well yeah. who were working in different teams, like communications, digital, et cetera. So we had like a pretty you know, well-rounded team around us. So when you're working on a team where most of you are black and you all get it, um, what's the next thing? And by mm. that, I mean, um, how does that level playing field mm. change the conversations you have? Mm. Besides not having to explain to somebody, mm -hmm. now when you're talking about something historical or a certain story, how does that actually change your process. It's incredible. You are pushed to new heights. How? People start asking complex questions. And that absolutely changes the conversation. You're mm -hmm. able to move into places that perhaps the storytelling would not have allowed if we weren't all coming from different perspectives mm -hmm. of blackness, right? That was, that was beautiful. Uh, what was one of your first challenges then with the project? You know, it, because we were doing something that was different, we uh, had an advisory, a community advisory board. We had 10 advisors. Um, we had to navigate how to bring them in in ways that didn't um, 
put in question our journalistic integrity. Right? What do you mean? What I mean by that is how do we get community input and get challenge in our storytelling while retaining our journalistic uh, decision, our editorial decision making, mm -hmm. but at the same time listening, really, 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 really deeply listening and not just surfacey, thank you for being here, thanks for telling us your ideas, see you next time, but more like a deep relationship building, which, took, which takes time, right? One thing that we came across personally as a storyteller, we were hearing from people that we wanted to involve in the project, and black people on the party saying, we don't necessarily trust that this will be different than other stories, because we've seen that the media can be harmful and project stereotypes in the storytelling. So we don't really think that you'll be different. They said these words to you? Well, we did hear that. And how did you answer? Well, two things. Number one, we recognize that. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Our profession has been harmful in many cases. But we are committed to making it different in the situation that we're in right now with this particular project. This is our commitment to you. You invited a number of people to be part of an advisory board, and yes. that was super important to you. Yes. Um, how did you create the board, and how did you decide who was going to be on it? Okay, great question. So we, three prairie provinces, we knew that we wanted three people per province. Mm -hmm. So that brought us to nine people. But then we were like, how about one more just to make it 10? <laughs> uh, so there was a bonus person. Well, everybody was great. Yeah. Um, but the, you know, just beyond that, uh, we knew that we wanted people who were different. Uh, we wanted academics, we wanted um, artists, mm -hmm. we wanted community organizers, mm -hmm. we wanted all different kind of people, and we wanted different generations, we wanted different identities. We had Afro-Indigenous people on the board. That was really, really important to us. And it wasn't just, let's just have one person. It was like, let's actually have two Afro-Indigenous people, mm -hmm. so that it's not just that one person, right? Yeah. So you gathered these people together, and they knew what was up. You all. You all knew why you were there. Um, how do you manage? You just described a, a number of different people across different kinds of diversity. Yes. So, um, how did you manage things when people disagreed with each other? Oh, we listened. We listened and we tried to find a common ground. This might also be because, you know, some of us are Africans around the table. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's a way of inviting conversation without shutting it down mm -hmm. and inviting disagreement mm -hmm. and actually being open to adapting when conversations get hard. Um, and we, we made sure to do that mm -hmm. consciously. We were very, very intentional with this project. I want to move on to who you are as okay. a journalist very soon. But um, what did you, before we get off of um, Black on the Prairies, and of course later on people can ask questions about it, um, what did you get out of this project? Black on Prairies changed my life. Mm. It changed who I am as a woman, as a person, as a black woman in Canada. It gave me grounding. Through this project, I learned about the deep history of Black Prairie people in Canada. And that contributed to making me a better person. Mm -hmm. You're an African woman who has, who has come here and you are so interested in the histories of other Black people you see here. How does that fit into your relationship with your own personal history? Hmm. I'm going to answer that question from a different vantage point. Answer it how you like. Okay. So part of my work as a reporter is to meet people who are different from me, constantly. People who um, live in different worlds than I do, who have different cultural references, who speak different languages than I do, but you know, I've had to learn other languages as well to be able to communicate across differences. And I've learned through my work to actually adapt to people and to adapt to 
differences so that we were, were able to communicate. Mm. And that, I think, is what animates my work. And, you know, when we talk about blackness and praise, we're also talking about blackness in Canada, but we're also talking about Canadians. Who are we as a country? Who are we as a country? And that's where journalism has such a powerful role to play. Mm -hmm. We're able to show stories that constitute us. And what would your grandmother say about this project? Oh, goodness. <laughs> oh, God. What would my grandmother say? Nana Abba. <laughs> um, I think she would be proud. I think she would be proud. Yeah. OK, so uh, you have talked about the importance of supporting journalists of color. You've been um, something that is, is in you. You, uh, you and I have talked about yes. things before in other, in other instances. Um, but you are adamant about how the industry should support journalists of color in their projects. Uh, what are some specific areas that you think they need that su support? Hmm. You know, I think being able to attract talent and retain talent and promote talent is very important. Giving that talent the support it needs to thrive in our industry is very important. And we live right now in a moment in Canadian journalism that is actually a very difficult moment where people are getting harassed, people are getting serious threats. And these journalists from these communities, who are Canadians, need to be protected. Mm -hmm. And they need to be given the support. They need to do the work. Mm -hmm. Why are they doing the work? For Canadians. We're all serving the public interest. I want to um, get into what it's like for journalists of color who are getting that online hate. But internally, like within a, an organization, uh, what is it that newsrooms can do, editors can do, um, co-workers can do when journalists of, uh, journalists of color are, like they have an idea for something like you did. Mm -hmm. They have a project. Mm -hmm. How can they be supported? Well, listen to them and put the resources behind them. Like show real support. Mm -hmm. There was a line that you said. Um, I actually want I want you to repeat it. Um, you said, I, I don't know if you can remember the line. OK. But it was about how racialized journalists are uniquely positioned mm -hmm. in this moment. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the line? Yes. OK. <laughs> yes, racialized journalists, particularly black, indigenous, um, and journalists of color are um, uniquely positioned to, through their, their contacts, through their perspectives, through their lived experience, to bring a different understanding mm -hmm. of our country. Why do you think you have to say that? Because it's important. And it's important to say that because of because diversity and inclusion are really important in our country. Um, I think, personally, when I think about the sheer um, opportunity to have been able to do this project, I mean, we were, we're now able, students, picture this, 13, 12-year-old, 5-year-old students in Winnipeg, you know, in Saskatoon, in Red Deer, Alberta, in Moncton, can learn about their country mm -hmm. in new ways. Mm -hmm. That to me is so powerful. It really is. Um, I said I was going to ask you about yourself. Yes. <laughs> um, when you were talking about online hate, mm. And you mentioned that you've got death threats. 
there was a pause, and we all felt you in that pause. Mm. So I just want to tell you that we feel you. Thank you. We felt it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I'm sorry that it's happening to you. Thank you. Um, when we do this work mm -hmm. of standing up for ourselves and standing up for anyone who is like us, it is hard and it can be um, debilitating. Hmm. So how have you been thriving? Mm. With community. I'm very fortunate to have sisters, uh, other journalists of color, um, who have stood by me and people that I can <laughs> send a message through WhatsApp. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I message you through WhatsApp, you know. Um, and that's why I'm so fascinated, and I think it's important to talk about collective care and how we show up for each other. You know, we know that governments need to act. We know that social platform, social media platforms need to act. We know that there needs to be industry standards. But we also need to recognize that at a human to human level, we need to show up for each other. Mm -hmm. So in this time when there is this uh, uh, online hate, um, how are people showing up for each other? How are journalists who are experiencing this, and by this I mean um, hate that is coming at them through emails, through Twitter, how are they caring for each other? I think people have definitely found ways to be in communication with each other, mm -hmm. which is really important. Like that solidarity is fundamental. Um, that's definitely one powerful way that I've seen it happen. And do you feel supported? Yes. Okay. Um, you talked about how since the project you've been getting online hate, but you were getting things before. Yes. Uh, you used to share what it was that people said to you. Mm -hmm. Like some time ago, maybe it was a year ago, or, or mm -hmm. but you made a decision to stop actually sharing the contents of what you were getting. Mm -hmm. Why did you make that decision? That's a really important question, Naraba. Thank you for asking that. Um, a while ago, I thought it was so important to raise awareness. And I still continue to think it's important. And so I was sharing screenshots of messages I was receiving. And people were responding to that, particularly on Twitter. Um, and I think the majority of people were shocked to see the vile language that is used, the racist slurs, the, 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 the sexist messages, the misogynistic language. Um, just, you know, terrible stuff. And so a lot of solidarity came out of that. Now, in this present moment, mm -hmm. I don't do it anymore. I don't share screenshots of what I receive. And there's a reason for that for me. It's because I don't want to give space to that language in my curated digital space. And I don't want them to know that their language is circulating on my platform. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's really important to have boundaries. Now, I do that, but I also, you know, I, I don't share those things, but I also tweet about how it's happening. Mm -hmm. So that they know, that I know, that other people know it's happening. Not everybody feels that way. Right. There are people who share mm -hmm. the precise thing that is being given to them. Sure. What do you think of that? I think, you know, we're human beings. 
So we make our own decisions. Mm -hmm. People react to um, what's thrown at them differently. That's my own personal decisions mm -hmm. I made as a journalist and mm -hmm. as a human being. I think I, what, I'm, what I'm getting at is that some people feel that, you know, everybody needs to know. They need to know how bad it is, how vile it gets. Mm -hmm. um, and you used to think, you used to feel that way. I still think that way. But my point is that you don't feel like you need to share the precise words. Yes. And I just want to know what switched. I realized that as a black journalist, I will most likely face online hate mm -hmm. for the nature of my work. And that that might never stop. That that might actually be part of me doing my work in our country. And that's very sobering. Mm -hmm. That's very, very sobering. Mm -hmm. And when I realized that, I thought, what am I going to do now? What am I, as Omaira Isa, as a journalist who, you know, plans on keeping going in the industry, in the profession, what am I going to do? Well, I am going to mitigate as much as I can the impact of this. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to expose other people to this kind of language. I don't want, you know, a woman, a black woman, you know, I don't want other human being coming, beings coming on my Twitter and then seeing all this stuff that's mm -hmm. triggering and, and difficult, you know. But it doesn't mean that I need to go through it alone either. You should know that this is like, this is really a conversation that, we've, that we have among, amongst ourselves. Really, we do talk to each other about whether or not we share the things that have come to us. Right. And um, we also, I think many of us also feel We feel like whatever you whatever decision you make is yours. Oh yes, absolutely. Right, whatever decision you make is yours. Mm -hmm. And I really do think it's a tricky conversation. It is. It can be really tricky. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like for you, it was a bit of a journey from everyone's getting it to they will know that this exists. They don't need to know the specifics, but everyone needs to know that it's happening. That's right. So. Um, it's really arresting when you see something coming to you. Mm -hmm. How do you manage it in those moments? What happens in your body? <laughs> what happens when you get death threats? Um, I'm sorry to ask you this, mm -hmm. but you know what I'm asking. Yes. It is... arresting it stops you in your tracks but here is the reality for me i will not be stopped in my tracks yeah so then i find ways to work through that and i've been lucky to have an incredible community around me very close people who have supported me through that and continue to. And, and I know who I am. You know, when people attack you for who you are, what you represent, it can strike at the core of who you are. Mm -hmm. But I know that the vile language they use against me is not who I am. So I remind myself of that. And I make sure to put that on social media as well. Mm -hmm. What do you want people around you to do when you tell them? Like, how do you want people to um, be with you mm -hmm. in the newsroom? Like, I'm imagining myself in the newsroom with you and knowing that this has come to you and we work together or we're working on a story together. Mm -hmm. What do you want me to do? Well, that's a really powerful question and I'm glad you asked that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Um, I want people to show solidarity. I want them to show that they care and that they're noticing and that if it's not happening to them and it's happening to me, it still impacts them. Mm -hmm. Say more. I'm a black journalist. I'm a black woman. Um, I know that I cover stories about race. I have other colleagues who cover stories about race who are not black, who are not women, and they don't get the hate that I get. I want those journalists to say, Omera, we hear you, we see you, and this is not okay. How, how can them knowing about the depth of this and that it happens, how can that inform the work they do? That's a really important question as well. You like my question. I really do because <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm glad we're in conversation because I think, you know, nuances comes up. Um, what is happening to some journalists is happening to all of us in many ways, indirectly or directly. And hopefully people will cover more and more of these stories in the media. We need to raise the public awareness. You know, when you put things on Twitter, I think people on Twitter will catch on on that. But not all Canadians are on Twitter. Not all Canadians know that if me, as Omera Isa, bringing the news to you on your TV or on your radio mm -hmm. or on the internet, that actually I just had a really difficult day because I just had death threats. People are in their living rooms, they don't know that. Mm -hmm. They just know that I've delivered the news to them. So it's really important to raise the public's awareness. Um, you had mentioned community before and communities of, of, of care and, and caring. Yes. Um, you have come up at a time, like uh, we have both noticed that there are more racialized journalists uh, coming into the industry. Mm -hmm. um, what do you want to tell them about their work and what they're coming into mm. and how to thrive? I have a lot to say about that. I know. <laughs> to the racialized journalists listening tonight in the room and elsewhere, your voice, your work is essential, is important to our country. And we need you in our industry more than ever. Please do not give up. How do you know they want to give up? I've gotten messages from people. Mm -hmm. I've gotten messages. What do they say? I'm thinking of not doing this. I'm in journalism school, but I'm not think, you know, I'm thinking of not going into the industry. I'm really scared. I'm seeing what's happening to you. I'm not sure if this is for me. Mm -hmm. um, I'm hearing. I wish things were different. I feel very vulnerable. I'm hearing um, this, is, this is a difficult moment. And it is. And I tell them, yes, it is. But please don't give up because we need you. Yeah. Um, I would like to pass things over to the folks in the crowd. Um, we have two mics here and we have Look at all the hands. And we all, uh, also have some people uh, on the Zoom uh, who have questions. Before we do, I just want to say, Omaira, it's really important for me to be sitting here with you. Mm. Um, we both work at CBC, and we're both black journalists. We're both Africans. We both have braids. Um, <laughs> Are and, they nice? <laughs> yes. Thank you. Okay. And um, it's just really nice to know that someone is there sometimes. It's yes. just really nice to yeah. know that someone's there. Yeah. Because for so much of, I can say from my career, I didn't always feel like somebody was there. Mm -hmm. I just didn't. And there are times when you do speak up mm. and you can feel really alone, even though you know what you're saying is right. Mm. So I'm glad you're here. Thank you. OK, let's I'm get glad to we're here.
So if, if people want to use the microphones for the questions, that way it'll be in the recording and on the Zoom. And I'm sort of looking at the Zoom to see as questions drop in. So yes. uh, a friend of yours, uh, Akhil Varani in Toronto, okay. sends greetings Hi, and Akhil. love. And also a question. So the question, I can imagine that building such important work that you're personally invested in can be taxing and exhausting week after week, month after month. Mm. What do you do for fun? How do you rest? <laughs> How do you rest and recharge so you can do your best work? Ah, oh, thanks, Akil. Prairie sunsets. Hey. <laughs> That's why I wanted to start with sunsets. Um, connection to the land is very important to me, and deep, meaningful relations with people are really important to me. And so, I take a lot of prairie sunsets. Um, and that is such an important question, right? How do we take care of our spirits when we're doing hard work? Um, and we can go through hard moments in our separate, in our different careers, in our different walks of life. How do we take care of ourselves? And for me, it's been through connection to the land and through connection, deep, 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 deep kinship connections with community members. I struggled a lot with thinking of like just the right questions because mm. I promise you we are the same person. I'm doing the exact same work. So I'm like, what's a deep question that I should ask? Like, how do I connect with her? Mm -hmm. Like, my work is in Thunder Bay. I'm doing like Thunder Bay in the 1800s. So okay. I'm gonna hit oh, whoever is yes. in Ottawa. Mm -hmm. Like, we're gonna be talking. Okay. Um, but when you said, um, when mm -hmm. you asked, what would your grandmother say if mm. she was here? I also, we're the same person. I also carry my grandmother with me. Mm. And I'm going to be my grandmother as your grandmother. Mm. And are there any Zim people here? I need your help for 20 seconds. Any Zimbabwe people? Any? <laughs> I'll do it myself there if there aren't any. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> um, I don't know, West African? But in Zimbabwe, nah, there oh, we go. No, you, you need to know. You need to know. I don't, but if my grandmother was here mm. and you were me, this is what she would do. Um, the essence of it is what is this relationship that's like buddy kind of thing, but it's also we do this in celebration. If I was graduating, anything, that's what she would do. I'm loud, so I think it would be I fine. Know. Chigutiro, Tambo, Uh, I'm Randy Boswell, one of the profs here in the journalism department. Um, I, I wish it were the case that it was uh, sort of only a, kind of a tiny fringe of uh, bigots and trolls who were threatening Canadian journalists. Um, but it's uh, we're we're in a position where you know one of the main political parties in the country has basically decided to freeze out mainstream journalists from. Um, uh, you know, reporting the news and engaging in that conversation. I just wondered what the conversation is like at the CBC right now with a party dedicated to defunding and potentially dismantling the CBC um, and uh, what your thoughts are about that context we're in. Thankfully, I'm a Massey Fellow right now for a year. Um, so I'm not privy to those conversations. Unfortunately, I'm not able to answer that question. Do you have a Thank sense, you. though? Do you what? Do you have an idea I really of what don't. it might be like? I really don't. Are you okay with that? I like. I, how do you feel about not being there to to discuss these these things? I understood years ago that what my work is, and my work is to push for conversations when they need to happen and where they need to happen. And that's what I focus on. No, you go ahead. Sure, okay. Uh, Chris Waddell, um, a question about your work on the project. Yes. Um, in your work on the project, did you find there were differences in the experiences of people in Manitoba and Saskatchewan and Alberta? Mm -hmm. If so, what were they and why do you think that was? That's a beautiful question, mm -hmm. absolutely. 
there are definitely regional differences within that space, that prairie space. Um, for instance, in Alberta and Saskatchewan, like I mentioned a bit earlier, a lot of the black communities were rural settlements. Um, but in, in Manitoba, they had a very large urban population because of the railroad in Winnipeg. So that, you know, adds a different layer. Um, what's really interesting these days is the fact that the fastest growing black population in our country is right on the prairies. And it's driven mainly by migration from African countries. And I'm from that migration. Mm. Uh, my family and I, we arrived more than 20 years ago, um, 22 years ago, and we are part of that a black African migration coming into, into the prairies. And you find those similarities in those three provinces as well. And you're finding black people in rural areas now, um, doing all different kinds of work and uh, contributing in all different kinds of ways. Yeah, great question, thank you. Okay, I haven't fully formulated my question, but do you need time? No, I want to. Okay. I want to say it, okay. and then it'll come. Uh, my name is MJ. I'm a professor at Concordia, and I'm thinking about anti-black racism and how to address it in the Canadian context. And so, I've there's so many, and I I know you, and I know the Black on the Prairies project, and somebody else is involved in it. Um, but the things that your speech made me think about first were this piece about. Um, journalism's ideal being uh, holding power to account, but something like Black on the Prairies questioning the ways in which journalism has been complicit in power harming Black and other communities. So that's one thing that I'm left with and thinking a lot about your role and the role of Black journalists and the role of other people in acting as a corrective to that, like Black on the Prairies being a corrective to that. Um, the thing I think I'm struck with as a black person is the onus falling on you <laughs> to do that work on the one hand, so to kind of right journalism's wrongs and to be in a position where like because journalism is presented as something unbiased and neutral and just reporting of the facts that you guys, both of you are in constant position to say we're speaking from a black position, but white people are never in a position of saying we're speaking from a white position, right? So the whole journalistic record has been from a white position, but white people have never been in a position to have to say that and to address that. So I think the thing I'm struck with, so I'm not sure if, you, if the question's for you, mm -hmm. this is just what I'm thinking of in relation to what you're saying, is like, how is it, <laughs> what does it mean that the onus has fallen on you guys to redress journalism's harms uh, what does that mean for the young black and racialized and indigenous journalists here? And like, where is it that, you know, white journalists, and maybe that is who the question is for, like, where is it that you guys are taking account for white journalism? Like, because, I mean, you talk about defunding the CBC, that call, you know, like one, one, sorry, now it's turning into a No, I think I, I see, can I, can I try and can I summarize? Can I try something? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it feels like what you're saying is, uh, why is it, or what is it like? I don't oh. want it to be an individualistic question though. I don't want to be like, what is it like for but you? But we're discussing it here. So it's yeah. the, the answer will be individualistic uh, potentially, right? So yeah. let me, just, let me just try this okay. anyway. Right. Okay. So it feels like what you're saying is, what is it like, um, uh, being part of the folks who have to do the work all the time, perhaps not all the time. That's, that's not the okay, okay. Do you want to try? <laughs> yeah, I feel like I actually feel like the question is: Thank you for doing that work uh -huh. and bringing it into the room. And my, I think my question is: How are the rest of you going to be accountable yes. to the work that they're doing? on your behalf mm -hmm. and I don't and and who has been accountable to you mm -hmm. in that regard like who are the non-black non-indigenous people mm -hmm. who have been accountable to black journalists and racialized journalists and indigenous journalists who are doing the work of redressing Canada's racism right and 
like that's the question. Is what are people going to do? Has how will they be accountable? How, how can they do it? Who are the people in this room that are going to do it? That kind of, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I have thoughts. What that's it, what I was thinking. No, 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 I have yeah. thoughts. Go, go ahead. What are, you, what are your thoughts about that? I think that's Thank really, you. I think that's a really important question. Um, you know, how, and, and I think that's why towards the end of my remarks, I said, how are we going to show up for each other? Mm -hmm. um, how are we, from our places of privilege, going to show up for others? Um, that's something that I'm very, very interested in, and I think in journalism as a profession, there's a place for that conversation. What have you seen? What have you experienced in terms of how, um, and I'll to put it to your question, what have you seen in terms of how white journalists, white academics, um, or we could even say just non-black non journalists, sorry about that, non-black journalists, non-black academics, how are they being accountable? How are they showing up? Mm. So in my experience with Black on the Prairies, I have had definitely, you know, white colleagues support my work. Um, and that has, that is really important. And I think actually that question is a fundamental question. Um, how do other people show up for the work, the heavy lifting that we're doing as racialized Black Indigenous journalists in our country? Because it gets at the root of how the change will happen. That's right. Frankly, yes. Because the change can come from us in our, you know, in our ways when we get positions and when we're given stages. It can go so far. This is very nice, right? This is very nice. It's cool to be seeing us talking to each other, but the work will be in how you write your stories, who you choose for your stories, how you treat your coworkers when things happen, and how you engage the, with, with the mistakes you will ne inevitably make. Mm. Yeah. But I'll get down. Really I'll good. get down and you can. No, I agree. <laughs> yeah. I can go next. Yes. Yeah. Um, hi. First of all, thank you so much for thank coming you. here tonight and talking to all of us. It was very enlightening. Uh, my question is about some of the more practical ways in which we can pitch projects as ambitious as these, because that mm. sometimes gets lost when we talk about larger issues of journalism. Uh, there are two concerns that I have in pitching these stories. Number one, we as racialized journalists often feel like we're competing for resources against other stories of racialized communities, uh, because that pool of resources seems very small, and we're often put in the difficult position of checking our own privilege and saying, no, maybe this project needs you know, precedence over this idea that I have. And the second thing is that as journalists, we're often told to think about what's new, what's happening now, what's ha what happened on Friday, what happened last month or last week. Um, whereas for many communities, there's a backlog of stories that haven't been told yet for the last 100, 200 years. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what Black on the Prairies did so well. Um, so how do you marry history and journalism? And how do you convince newsrooms that that these are all stories that need to be told. How, how do you do that? Practically speaking, how do you go about that? What's the pitching process like? Mm -hmm. That's such an important question. Um, I want to talk about the context a little bit to do justice to the importance of your question. Um, we were right coming out of the Black Lives Matter movement protests. There was a heightened awareness around blackness in Canada and globally. And I think that, in many ways, helped with the process, with the reception of the pitch. Um, so I, I don't want to say that this happened in a vacuum. This happened in a particular context. And I think it's really important to recognize that. Your question, I think, speaks to some of the systemic barriers that exist sometimes to getting certain projects approved. Like you said, there's a backlog of stories. 100, 200 years, et cetera, which I agree with. Um, in terms of practical um, uh, tools, I, my stance has always been, how do we take complex issues and ideas and make them real for people? So to find characters who can drive your story, 
are, is really important in the pitching process. People need to be able to see it, to hear the story, um, or the stories, or the project. They need to be able to imagine it. And for us, we were very clear about the characters that we were going to go after to be able to um, carry the heavy storytelling of telling 200 years of Black Prairie life. Um, so I know that also in a certain way puts a lot of onus on, on you know, the racialized journalists trying to get the project approved. But, um, but that's also, I think, part of the beauty of the creative process of actually coming up with a project that is all encompassing. So I hope I answered your question a little bit. Yeah. Oh, you find as many voices as possible who can support your argument. Because we're in newsrooms, we have to fight for our stories, right? For our story ideas. And so we do that by saying, hey, I'm interested in this, but hey, listen, I'm not the only one. There's like communities, there's like hundreds, thousands of people going to attract those audiences too. So it becomes a question around relevance for our industry. A bit, bit of a burden of proof thing there. That's true. Isn't yeah. there? That there's, you've got to kind of like have more than the other folks for a certain story. Unfortunately, I, f I find that that, that that is what it is. But to his point, I, I wonder if you can answer the other part, which was what happens when you're told that there aren't enough resources for your story? That has happened to me. Mm -hmm. And I don't give up. I don't give up. That's just not how we're made. <laughs> I just keep pushing. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Hi. Thanks Hi. so much. Um, I'm Lehri Nanda. I'm a fourth year undergraduate journalism student. And I want to say that the human side of your opening remarks were what resonated most with me. Mm. And my question is, you spoke a little bit about being grounded through the process of working on Black on the Prairies. And I find often that when I'm doing my stories, I want to go in with that intentionality of choosing stories that resonate with my background. So as an international student from India coming here, you know, as part of this massive Indian diaspora in Canada, mm. where am I situating myself? And a lot of the times what happens is my identity ends up changing just by the small fraction by doing this one story, even if it's a small radio story on inflation and how that's affecting international students. So I want to ask about how your identity evolved, if at all, while working on Black of the Prairies mm. and maybe how you dealt with some thoughts that might have occurred to you about whether that change is real or whether you're just experiencing it in the moment because you're working on the story and engaging with so many different people? Mm, that's a really important question. I think checking in with ourselves is really important, especially as storytellers, because we're always uh, in conversation with others. And so knowing where we stand, who we are, what animates our work is really important. And you know, to your question about how did I change, I changed a lot. I became a better storyteller through Black on the Prairies. I became a better journalist. I became a more well-rounded Canadian um, mm. through that. And, and I was constantly aware of that change. And, and to be able to integrate that and say, this project has actually changed my life, is actually important. And yes, you're right. Stories that you tell will change you. They absolutely will. And that's why I talked about the sacredness of, of storytelling. And that's why I talked about bearing witness and the importance of that. Um, hi. Um, so hi. my question is, uh, when you guys were both talking, um, you're mentioning that you're reporting and you come off the camera. People at home are just, you know, thinking that you told a story. They have no idea that you received death threats that day or you've been receiving death threats. Um, how would you like news organizations going forward? How would you like the people that have the control over news organizations to address that in a timely way? Hmm. Um, I think news organizations have a huge responsibility in this moment to protect journalists who are under attack and who might be under attack. So it's not just about this moment. We have to look at it from the long-term perspective. You know, 
Um, I'm under no illusion that this will stop anytime soon. I don't think that all of a sudden we will have radio silence. Um, and I know that might be a bit uh, unsettling for some people to hear that, as it should be. It's unsettling. Um, and newsrooms can and should stand with their journalists. They need to put the resources in place, the supports in place. And they also need to be able to recognize if harm has been done and how to address that. So it's an accountability conversation that we need to have as well. Is it a public conversation at some point? Is it something that you feel like the news organizations uh, should address publicly? Or should it be something that um, entirely stays within the newsroom, within the control of the new organization? You know, that's a great question. I think both are happening at the same time. Uh, there's definitely, you know, there, there, was, there was a letter that was sent to uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Uh, there's been conferences around um, do not okay uh, conversation. Um, so those conversations are also happening publicly and they need to continue, they need to be happening publicly because Canadians are counting on us. Oh, you mean reflected back through the news? Yeah, essentially. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yes. Back to the people that sure. Have to yeah. Yeah. Like I know there has been some coverage um, of these stories, and it's really important that th that coverage is happening. We need to be able to raise awareness on this. Thank you for that question. We have two more questions. We'll go here. Hello, thank you very much for your speech. It's been very enlightening and it's nice to learn a bit more about Canada, particularly being from the West Coast. Mm. We don't often hear about the news after the mountains, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, but my question centers around how did French speaking black and Afro indigenous persons or communities in particular impact the development of the prairies mm. because we often hear about francophone communities but there's a huge subset of that of mm -hmm. black and afro-latino uh not afro-latino sorry afro-indigenous people mm -hmm. who speak french mm -hmm. and that became a big a big set of history so mm -hmm. thank you. what a beautiful question this this throws me right into the meat of black on the prairies and the conversations that you know we we were having um so a few things to that uh, I'm francophone. I'm from a French-speaking country in West Africa, Niger. Um, and as I said earlier, you know, my family is part of that most recent black migration from African countries, a lot of them francophone African countries. And we find within the, uh, this is actually very important because within the francophone communities in the prairies, there is a black minority within those communities who are doing incredible work. I remember when I went to high school, I did grade 11 and grade 12 in a French school in Saskatchewan, in Saskatoon. It was the only French school in the city. Um, and, then, and then I left the high school, went to university next door in Alberta, in Edmonton, and, uh, and came back. Um, when I was there, it was me, my two brothers, and this other student who were black students. And then I went to Alberta, came back six years later, and the makeup of the school has completely changed from teachers to, to students. Um, and that was very powerful to see, just like that the change, like there's an actual demographic shift happening on the prairies when it comes to Francophone communities and French-speaking black people mm -hmm. on the prairies particularly. And um, Afro-Indigenous people are incredibly important to the conversation and that's why in the Black on Praise project we wanted to make sure that black and indigenous relations was at the forefront of the conversation. You know, while we said that black people had been on the praise for 20, for 200 years, it wasn't to say that, you know, um, it, it, it was rec recognizing that while also holding the truth that um, indigenous people own the land and that um, black people have had relations with indigenous people for a very long time, for as long as they've been present in that region. And those relations continue, kinship relations, families, actual families. 
Um, and that's, that's a beautiful thing. That's a really beautiful and powerful thing. Yeah, thank you for that question. And we have our last here, okay. We see, oh, <clears throat> it is working. Hi, I'm Hi. Emma Stewart Kiss. I'm a third year journalism and political science student. And just to kind of end on hopefully somewhat of a lighter note, sure. when I first came across your like project, I first came across the Cadence Weapons story. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. And I was just so taken because I honestly had never seen multimedia used in that fashion before. So I just was hoping you'd be able to touch on kind of the creative process and even like how you and your team even conceptualize kind of the usage of multimedia in your project and maybe touch on kind of like, because you said from the start you would like it to be multimedia, so maybe the importance in storytelling. That's a great question. I mean, shout out to our digital team uh, that did this incredible work. We had an amazing designer who did a beautiful amount of work. We had photography that was really powerful. It was very clear from the very beginning that we wanted to create a museum-like uh, experience for people. So just like you can go to any museum in Ottawa or anywhere in, in the country or in the world and be immersed in a story, and come out of that having learned something, we wanted to do that with this. And so um, the pictures became really important, how we bolded some uh, quotes uh, in the Cadence Weapon piece was actually one of the most ambitious um, and original um, digital pieces that CBC has ever done. Uh, it was just like, digital, like at the design level, it was a complex thing to achieve. And, um, and I'm so proud of that. I'm so proud that we can um, show the breadth of black life in such a beautiful way, you know? Um, and that creative vision was there from the very, very beginning. We wanted to show beauty in our experiences. That's a great way to end this, isn't it? <laughs> um, to end this conversation on beauty, um, I think, uh, there is beauty in us having this discussion here yes. today, and uh, you also exemplified it in, in what you said for us, or in when you, what you said um, to us today. I think that we're all very grateful um, from the moment that you started speaking, and we have a lot to take from this conversation into our work and into our conversations and into our relationships with um, the industry and with others who are practicing it. Omarisa. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Omaira and Anaba, thank you. Uh, I can't thank you enough. And please understand, this is not just a conversation for an evening. Uh, this is an ongoing part of what we're trying to wrap our heads around at the school. We're looking at this event, other events, work in our curriculum. Uh, professors like Trisha Odent Longo and Matthew Pearson are doing both doing work in this area. This is something to answer the question from a colleague at Concordia, uh, we're seized of this and we need to play our role in the journalism industry as a journalism educational institution and figure out what, what can, can and should uh, we be doing. So thank you so much. Um, at, at the outset, I, I noted how the Kesterton is, is our major keynote event, recognizing one of the founders of our school and upstairs in our resource center, there is a room uh, named for Wilfred Kesterton. And in that room, you can see a sort of a hall of honor of the faces of all those who have delivered the Kesterton lecture since uh, the year 2000. Until tonight, on those previous 21 occasions spanning two decades, this keynote has never been delivered by a black woman or man. So thank you. Um, I don't, I think everyone gets the sense of the moment that we have been in, but just so you understand, this is the first time Omira has dealt with these issues in a public space. 
in, a, in an open venue. And it was a difficult decision for her to do that. And I just want to thank her for the bravery that she continues to show in putting herself out there at incredible risk and personal cost. So uh, thanks very much. I'm, I'm so proud of what you have done for us tonight and not proud of how long it took us to get here. So. Uh, thank you, Nanaba, for your terrific work as a moderator. Thank you to all those who helped to make this event happen, to those who helped us to record it and capture it. Um, Dave Elliott and Satin Adal from the school, uh, Patrick from, uh, from uh, Carleton University events. Uh, finally, thank you for attending this event. Please uh, stay tuned to our uh, website. We have a whole series of events going on in person this fall. But now that I'm standing between you and the food and drinks that are waiting in the atrium, uh, I will declare this portion of the evening to be out of close. Thank you. Thank you.